We've met, we're meeting here, we're going to have two brief uh, talks. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Battle of Gallipoli and what its context was, and then Rory's going to talk about Australia and New Zealand and the impact uh, the Battle of Gallipoli had on, on uh, Australia and New Zealand. Then we're going to show the last 30 minutes of the uh, Peter Weir movie, which I think shows in a really powerful kind of way what happened and the impact it had on the soldiers there and how I really did not understand what was going on until they got into it. And then we're going to open it up for a discussion uh, after, after the movie is over. And they could not hold on in Gallipoli. That's why they withdrew. So it was actually a change in the strategic uh, balance of uh, power that forced them to leave. Otherwise, I don't know how many more hundreds of thousands of soldiers they would have gotten killed in a completely wasted, pointless effort. So that was what Gallipoli, what Gallipoli was about. Um, <coughs> And uh, Rory's going to talk about Australia and New Zealand, where it had a huge impact. Sure. Yeah, no, as Eric says, it was um, really significant for Australians and, and New Zealanders at the time. Um, because uh, while you had plenty of Australians and New Zealanders more, in fact, um, involved in the Western Front, um, in those kind of uh, conflicts, there were individuals within um, greater sort of battalions of people from all over the empire. Um, whereas with Gallipoli, it was sort of the first time that you had units that were entirely people from New Zealand or people from Australia um, there. And so the fact that it was such a bloodbath meant that you had units that were dedicated to New Zealand troops that were just getting obliterated. Um, as Eric, Eric says, it devolved into trench warfare uh, very, very swiftly, um, but uh, without getting too into the geography and things, it was made worse <coughs> by the fact that if you see the region, it's all hills. Um, so you've got people who are uh, digging trenches into the side of a hill that someone is already on top of firing down into. Uh, it becomes, you know, um, you know, the phrase fish in a barrel. Um, and this was the kind of situation that they were in, not to mention the, the massive sort of um, uh, misorganization of it where there was no radio communications and boats were dropping soldiers off on the wrong beaches so that they were separated from everyone else. And uh, the whole landing had been telegraphed a month in advance um, because the uh, Navy had showed up and tried to get into the Dardanelles and then been blown up by mines. And so immediately the Ottoman Empire began setting up machine gun embankments all the rest of it. So, but that is a uh, more technical sort of side of things. Uh, today I'll be speaking primarily about the New Zealand perspective rather than the Australian or Turkish one because it's the history I'm most familiar with. Uh, I won't be trying to convince anyone that the soldiers at Gallipoli were bad people or challenging their reputation for carrying out impossible orders in nightmarish conditions and I certainly won't be arguing that what they saw and did should not should be forgotten. Um, I will be talking about, as Eric says, the suffering and damage that the campaign wreaked on New Zealand's people, um, the way that it was so massively out of proportion with any perceived reward, uh, and I'll also talk a little about how people look for meaning in that kind of crisis, um, and how political institutions have turned that particular story to their advantage. Um, so. I'll as Eric says, a lot of historians who work on the First World War uh, really struggle to get across the sheer scale of, of its killing fields. Um, the mechanized slaughter is a term I've heard a lot. Um, that's really not a problem with Gallipoli because the numbers are, are so stark. Um, where the French have Verdun and the English have the Somme, uh, New Zealand in particular, I know, has uh, Chanuk Bear, which is a nondescript hill in a region that, as I've said, is covered in hills. Um, where 760 men from the Wellington Infantry Battalion clambered to the summit before dawn one morning in August. By sunset, 70 were left. Um, of the 8,556 New Zealanders who arrived at Gallipoli, um, barely 500 left with both their minds and bodies intact. Nearly a third were killed outright. Uh, and in a country as small as New Zealand, the numbers lost to this war are even more sobering. Um, as I say, there were many other uh, New Zealand soldiers who were elsewhere um, in, the, in the region, in uh, Europe, along the Western Front. Um, and ultimately, a full 5% of New Zealand's military-age males died in the space of four years. 
Um, and so Gallipoli became a kind of shorthand for this massive, massive waste of life. Um, those who survived with mental or physical trauma would come home to societal attitudes that really haven't significantly changed in a century. Um, those who lost limbs were swiftly channeled into government training programs that sought to make them cobblers or cabinet makers um, with the expectation that they should go and work for a living uh, regardless of their experience. Um, those with mental illness who were unable to mask their symptoms were initially simply put into asylums in jail-like conditions if they had no relatives who were willing to or able to care for them. Uh, and then only later after an outcry they were sent to um, dedicated care homes, but not with significantly different conditions. Um, while they were classified under the 1911 Mental Defectives Act as either idiots, imbeciles, epileptic or feeble-minded, they were at least distinguished in the popular press as broken heroes, deserving of sympathy, as opposed to the incurable criminal elements and sexual deviance that most people with mental illness were portrayed as. Um, there's little that I can say about the subjective <coughs> experience of shell shock and post-traumatic stress um, and the resulting cost to uh, survivors and their families. Um, and obviously many of those survivors went to their graves in silence, not talking about their experiences at all. Um, but there is an excerpt from One Soldier's Diaries that I would like to read because uh, in coming across it I realised how um, easily that could come to me. I could see how it would happen. Um, it's a, a man named Private Stark, <coughs> and uh, yeah, when I read this piece I could imagine him sort of stepping outside uh, in the middle of a summer in New Zealand where the sun is very, very hot, and um, just the heat on the back of his neck kind of triggering a, a memory like this. Uh, I'm afraid it is quite graphic. but uh, From the diary of Private J.D. Stark, uh, 5th Regiment Reinforcements, Otago Infantry Battalion. But the dead who waited in no man's land didn't look like dead, as the men who came to them now had thought of death. From a distance of a few yards, the bodies, lying in queer, huddled attitudes, appeared to have something monstrously amiss with them. And then the burying party, white-faced, realized that 24 hours of the Gallipoli sun had caused each boy to swell enormously, until the great threatening carcasses were three times the size of a man and their skins had the bursting blackness of grapes. It was impossible to recognize features or expression in that hideously puffed and contorted blackness. So next I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, sacrifice. And no matter what year it falls in, the dawn service marking the Gallipoli landing is a big deal for white New Zealanders and some Māori. Um, if you're young and rich, uh, your family might send you to Cape Helles itself as a kind of um, backpacking trip. Or if you're an ordinary person like me, uh, you gather in the dark by a town cenotaph. Uh, I've been to many of the ceremonies myself and um, consistently uh, the casualties of Gallipoli are described as a sacrifice. Um, I've always found that strange because uh, the loss of something, even a life or thousands of lives, is only a sacrifice when it is freely traded away to protect something. And uh, yet no one in respectable politics ever seems to have the same answer when you ask what those soldiers were protecting. Um, sometimes they say the soldiers were fighting for the man next to him, which doesn't really answer the question. And sometimes they say the soldiers were protecting freedom, uh, which makes even less sense in the Middle East of 1915 than it does now. <laughs> um, a current Prime Minister in New Zealand uh, has actually said that they died to preserve living standards for future generations. Um, the only people who can all give you the same answer are military historians, and as Eric said, they will tell you quite matter-of-factly um, that New Zealand and Australian soldiers were sent there um, because New Zealanders and Australians were subjects of a British dominion and British admirals and generals wanted to draw the Ottoman Empire's troops and material away from the Russian border. This is an accurate answer, um, but I think it's too cold and technical to be the answer we actually want. You'll never hear it recited at any of these uh, Gallipoli ceremonies. Um, 
it may even respire, inspire a sort of revulsion because of the way it sweeps over the scale of human suffering involved. Um, I think it's an answer we don't, hear, we don't want to hear um, because memorial services are about thinking of human beings as individual people rather than as things or tools. Uh, and when we think of them as people, uh, it's very hard to believe that such murder was more worthwhile than a piece of paper with the word treaty on it. <coughs> There's another answer which is, I think, just as upsetting but more straightforward, um, which is that by 1915, uh, everyone was fighting other people's wars and were too polite to stop. Uh, New Zealand and Australia were literally a world away from the hills they were dying on, as there it says. Um, but like the Ottoman Empire, they'd simply been picked for opposing sides. The Ottoman Empire's ministers maintained power of their own subjects with German military aid, and the colonial administrators of Australia and New Zealand similarly depended on commercial ties with Britain to maintain their positions. And likewise, the powers of Britain and Germany had themselves arrived at a great war because of mutual aid pacts rather than a uh, direct threat. Um, and when the dead were now numbering in the millions, there were no peace terms that could even begin to justify the slaughter. Uh, an exchange of a few hundred acres of land or a few thousand pounds of gold as reparations were simply ludicrous. Um, I think a lot of people here are familiar with Red Clydeside, obviously. Um, and that was bad enough for Lloyd George, but almost every power in the war at that stage feared that they would be overthrown by their own subjects in some sort of revolutionary situation, unless they managed to grind another power down to total surrender first. So in the end, uh, I think that was the sacrifice at Gallipoli. Um, Young men from New Zealand and Australia and uh, modern day Turkey um, who were maimed and shot to death so that the political classes of all of these countries could maintain their hold on power. So some might say that none of this matters now and that the important thing about Gallipoli was that the deployment of New Zealand or Australian soldiers in their own units and the unity of purpose and shared suffering that ensued brought about a, a new sense of national identity. Um, and that's what's worth remembering. Um, some even go so far as to describe it as the birth of a nation. And this is certainly the view of history that uh, the New Zealand government is now advancing. Uh, but I would argue that these <coughs> particular commemorations and the historical ideas that underpin them are embraced by my country's government because they are useful to the white establishment. Um, Gallipoli as a dawning of national identity is a tragedy that is consigned to history. Um, there's nothing more to be done. Whereas, uh, which I think stands in very stark contrast to the deep rifts left by another traumatic event in New Zealand's founding history, uh, which is the Treaty of Waitangi, which was signed uh, with the Māori people. The, um, the history of the treaty and uh, the breaches of it would be a series of talks all by themselves, but um, but I think it's fair to say that the Crown's intentions were clear. It was about assuming control of the land at Māori people's expense through legislation and land grabs and massacres and mercenary tactics and all the tricks in the book. Um, but I just, I mention that because, as I say, I think there's a very stark contrast. Um, in New Zealand, for instance, our White Race Relations Commissioner uh, insists that Waitangi Day should be just a holiday. Um, and a newspaper's advertised protest-free editions in each February. Um, Gallipoli, meanwhile, I think, is so keenly remembered as a moment of national unity because it helps us forget about Waitangi. Some New Zealanders might argue that we should remember both, uh, and they would be right to do so. After all, there were Māori soldiers at Gallipoli too. Um, there were some 477 soldiers of the native contingent who arrived at Anzac Cove in August. Uh, they were reduced to just 134 men in the space of four months. Um, but the establishment's particular version of the Anzac history, which is heavy on camaraderie and mutual respect, um, is itself very carefully crafted to remember Māori only when they are useful. Um, far from brothers in arms, the British Empire's administrators had initially refused to enlist Māori uh, out of fears that sending them to battle white people abroad would encourage them to take up arms again when they were demobbed and sent home. Uh, the New Zealand Expeditionary Forces Commander, Major General Sir Alexander Godley, 
only relented when it was realized that the Ottoman Empire's soldiers could be considered an acceptably brown enemy. Uh, even then, Māori were only allowed to be elevated to the position of junior officer. It was still very much uh, an empire army run by white people. Uh, uh, meanwhile, many Māori tribes themselves were far from enthusiastic about the war effort. Uh, with the imperial conquest, uh, which was known as Te Riri Pakeha, or white man's anger, um, was still well within living memory for most people. Um, those Māori who are honoured in today's Gallipoli ceremonies were overwhelmingly recruited from the Aroa and other iwi who had allied themselves with the crown in those wars in the hopes that they would be spared the worst of the land grabs. Meanwhile, for other tribes like the Tainui and the Waikato Maniopoto, the seat of a Kingi Tanga resistance movement, um, the sergeants would later return armed with conscription orders um, to drive home their obligations as subjects of the empire. When their young men refused under the leadership of Princess Tepua, they were jailed en masse in Auckland with the most influential agitators reduced to bread and water diets. Ultimately, the Crown failed to send a single one of these prisoners into the war. Now I'm telling you all this because it doesn't sound anything like the New Zealand that white people were talking about last night uh, and this morning. But if we let the people in power dictate our history, they will always shape it into a tool with which to control us. Gallipoli became the story not of colonialism and empire, but of courageous Anzacs banding together and coming to the rescue. And that became the romance that lured the public into Vietnam and Afghanistan. Uh, I would imagine if, if the story of, as I say, colonialism and empire had been emphasized, I wonder if the public response to those wars would have been quite different. So yeah, as the cenotaphs say, let us, lest we forget. Thanks. It's a matter of how to get that kind of propaganda out to a wider audience. I mean, we're bombarded every day by propaganda from the state, the glory of war, the, the heroism, the beautiful pageantry of the banners flying, and this stuff is not shown. Uh, so your battle is trying to get this material out to as wide an audience as possible. I don't think anybody seeing that would actually think that there's anything to be gained by war. You know, it's, it's just a pointless, chaotic, murdering scene. Mm -hmm. right. The thing is, nobody wants to live at war, but what would, you, what would you have done if you were in charge in 1939 and Hitler was marching through Europe? ready to march into Britain, what would you have done? Nothing? Would you have let us been take o taken over? Killed? Well, I think when Britain has gone to war in defence, and the only reason we can sit here today, as I see it, we're sitting here on a Saturday afternoon, in a free country, able to voice our opinions, only because there are defence forces that we have working keeping watch 24 hours a day for you, for me, for all of us, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, all the intelligence services, intelligence services working in Britain and throughout the world for our benefit. Now, it would be a different country if that wasn't happening. Nobody wants war, nobody wants to be killed in a battlefield. We've had, my experience of war is being a child when the Second World War started starting school and when the war finished I was nine and still at primary school. My older brother was conscripted when he was 18 and served in the war in the Royal Navy in the Fleet Air Arm, served the war years on an aircraft carrier out east. My <coughs> father fought at Gallipoli and it was a, him and his brothers yeah, joined up willingly as young men. I fought at Gallipoli and he was wounded and fell and watching that I was thinking of my father falling in that battlefield. He was shot in the thigh and the bullets billock went right through it and out and it was days before he was picked up or it would have been probably into poison and gangrene but the bullet had gone out. <coughs> 
So <coughs> he was eventually taken to Alexandria in Egypt, where he was in a hospital. And when he recovered, he was sent to the Somme. And obviously, he got through that as well and got home, and so did his brothers. And I wouldn't be here speaking today if they hadn't. But nobody wants war. We all like to live in a country like we're living in today. And because of these people, that's the reason we're able to do that. Do you think that it's inevitable opinion. that there will be war? There is no alternative. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying nobody wants war because well, it's a horrible thing and loss of happen. life. But what would you do, you know, if it was back in 1939 or if that happened well, again, you have to what would you do? Would you picture. sit and just let yourself be... I mean, that's the propaganda we've been told, that we were fighting for democracy. We saved democracy. But before the 1914 war, there was no democracy. We weren't fighting for something we had. We didn't have yeah. it. After the war, we didn't have democracy. We didn't fight to get democracy because we never got it. 1939, across Europe, there was not democracy. So what were we fighting for? Fighting, so we're fighting to save your country save, and no, your life and your children's lives. Fighting to save the British Empire. You know? That's what we were fighting for. I don't think so. Well, no. that's a matter of opinion, but I think if you look at the history books, mm. it wasn't because some prince or duke got shot that the whole world suddenly turned and fought each other. I have studied history <coughs> a lot, and though I do agree that war is a terrible thing, and nobody wants to be involved in war, sometimes there's no alternative. Or you well, just stand that, there and let yourself occasion? and your children and your grandchildren be taken over, sent to concentration camps, or killed, or whatever. And you can't, you can't do that either. So I think you have to support the defence forces, and the fact, I think the, the fact that we are living in peace is because we have these deterrents in place. And if we, didn't, if we hadn't had these since the end of the Second World War, I'm sure we would have been invaded again and had another war, but we're living in peace. I we're not living in peace, sorry. Of course we are. I think there's two kind of issues here. I mean, nobody's talking about... I mean, the people in the out for these wars are very... Sorry, could you speak up a bit? People... It's funny, I can hear it really loud through that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people in the out for these wars. They were brave people, ordinary people. Yep. Brave, they were in the trenches. I mean, that's one part of it. The bravery of the people in the out done that. Nobody has any problem with that. It's, it's amazing that they did that thing. But it's the reasons why we did that thing. You know, so if we were out fighting the war to have a country fit for heroes, you know, to come back to what happened after the Second World War, you know, we come back to, you know, we'd automated everything. You know, women and kids were practically running the country, supplying all the food, the arms, and all that kind of stuff. So the whole process had been automated. So when these troops come back from the war, why didn't we give them all a job? But they use the automation to get rid of more folk off the workforce. I know it. You know what I mean? The world will never be but, perfect. But there's no choice. But to just but try there's no choice from us of okay. what we should have done with the spoils of winning the war. You know, we, we didn't have any say in it. We went and done the business, so these troops, so these brave people did that, and they come back to unemployment a lot. Of them. You know what I mean? So, how come all that automation wasn't used? To, to, to let people work a 20 hour day for instance, why is it just used in, in, in uh, elites making loads of money? And so, I mean if you look at the figures, if you look at the money after the war and who made money during the war, it gives you a good idea of why the war was fought. And that's completely different for the mm, bravery I suppose it's a different the issue. people who fought the war. You know, your freedom uh, is I'm, a different I'm issue you, from your the economy. grandfather really come back from Gallipoli feeling like he had gotten wounded for a good cause. I, what was, I mean, I find that sort of mind-boggling. Actually, at the time, nobody, well, I, well, I shouldn't say nobody, Woodrow Wilson claimed they were fighting for democracy, but the British didn't actually claim that. They were quite clear they were fighting for the British Empire. That's what it was about. There was no secret about that. They were fighting for the British Empire, as opposed to Germany, which was a threat to the British Empire. I mean, there was, everybody understood that's what, it was, what was going on. There was no particular secret about that. You know, the, the propaganda really started later than that. I mean, at the time, people were very clear. You're fighting, you going, your country is fighting for its spoils as against to other country, which is fighting for their spoils. And that's what it's about. 
And it seems to me that, you know, when you say the world isn't perfect, <laughs> that's putting it very mildly. We're talking about a world that was dominated by imperial powers that were willing literally to sacrifice millions of lives to protect their own interests. That's what it was about. <coughs> And I, I'm, I'm amazed. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people who came back from World War I understood fully well that they had been used as cannon fodder for the British Empire. Absolutely well, exactly. knew that. And you talk about World War II. At the time in World War I, people said, if you fight this war to the bitter end, which the British government insisted upon doing, and tr crush Germany, which was their, their explicit goal, you will lead to another war. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. So if you're looking at World War II, you have to go back to World War I mm -hmm. and what happened there. And so, there actually were choices. I mean, it's, I, I like Rory's speech, but that is, the truth is, there was a chance for peace in World War I. There was a chance to say, stop, we don't have to fight this to the bitter end. We can actually negotiate a peace. The British absolutely refused. Absolutely. They had no interest in negotiating with the German government. Their only interest was totally crushing it. That's what it was about. And that's why the war kept going on year after year after year. And why this slaughter, while it's particularly uh, poignant because, you know, the British were crushed, but, you know, on the Western Front, many, many more people were dying. Many, many more. And it's similar as kinds of scenes. And it went on year after year after year because the British government absolutely refused to negotiate. That's the history. So, you know, it's maybe a difficult history to deal with, but that is actually what happened. And your grandfather should have known that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a lot of the uh, soldiers who came back from World War I knew that. There was mutinies in the French army. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers said, enough, enough, we're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to go over the trenches like these people and get slaughtered. And then the French army actually had to back off. They could not do those kinds of mass attacks because they knew it would lead to more mutinies. And even in the British army, there were rumblings towards well, the end. Quite a few mutinies in the British army. Yeah. Uh, spread over a number of years during the war. And it's all kept under wraps. It's, right. Because you know, our troops don't do things like that. They're very honorable and follow the leader. Uh, but that's just a lot of hogwash. The thing is, though, that we're looking now at both wars, the First and the Second War, the children, that's, in, that's history now. But talking about the present day, we have deterrence in place and we should keep those deterrents in place and that stops war. And I see the way forward to peace as having deterrence that you don't need to use. Well, can I say something? Mm -hmm. You know, the it's like... The Second World War finished and people talk about we've had peace. Where is the peace? Britain. Yeah, I saw all this little island. Let's look at the rest of the world. We're responsible for an awful lot of the unpeace, as you want to call it. No, do they know? No, no we are not responsible for what's happening in other parts of the world. How do you make that out? Well, we'll just look at Iraq for one thing, Libya for another. I mean, it can go on and on. And if you're talking about Iraq, you're going again That's back to World War One, which was one of the spoils of the war. It was part of the Ottoman Empire until World War One. The British, as part of these secret treaties, got control of Iraq. Right. So, yeah, if I can um, respond to, as you said, the, um, the example of 1939. I think uh, in talking about, as we say, the, the way that the First World War ended, setting the kind of uh, foundations for the Second World War, I think maybe the, the response there is that um, the objection to, to um, a kind of unquestioning um, the acceptance of the military and intelligence services and this kind of thing is that um, <clears throat> that's a perfect example of how these sort of expeditionary wars um, you know wars that are uh, um, there to preserve the interests of say Britain um, then sow the seeds for um, horrific backlashes that are like you say ideological um, maybe this is a uh, delicate example, but for instance, the um, backlash that we now see with uh, ISIS, for instance, where that's a very um, ideologically founded kind <coughs> of uh, war that has come out of a, um, uh, 
a resource war um, invading Iraq initially, and then as a result, the kind of um, chaos that that created has created something, uh, a new war that is, um, as you say, the, the, the people involved in this are doing horrible things. But that has come about because of um, uh, Britain's foreign policy in the first place, creating this kind of uh, foundation for it. I'm afraid I'm sort of rambling a little bit, I'm muddling my words slightly. Um, but the second thing I, I also find it interesting, as you say, of contrasting um, Britain living in peace, uh, where it sounds like what you're saying is uh, being in a state where there is no land invasion, which obviously hasn't happened since you know, the Battle of Hastings. Um, but certainly through the, the First World War, uh, the British Isles were never at any sort of risk of invasion because there was this maritime power. I mean, part of the reason the Gallipoli campaign happened was because um, the British generals and admirals went, what, well, we have all of these battleships that we're simply not <coughs> using, um, that we're just basically um, roaming around protecting the channel. And likewise, in the Second World War, obviously, we had uh, aerial raids and this kind of thing, but there was never any serious likelihood of the land invasion, which is why the home front was not a, um, <coughs> a particularly uh, well-resourced um, operation. Um, so there's that aspect of it, but then, as I think some other people have touched on, um, that was not a state of peace. Um, Britain has had all kinds of military operations uh, going on in other places where it is uh, occupying, um, and that has been in pursuit of um, economic interests, uh, geopolitical alliances, this kind of thing, but it's certainly not peace. But the, there's been wars in various places since time began, and I think the best thing is defence. I mean, to look at it on a, a simplified level, defence, <coughs> do you go to bed at night and leave your doors and your windows wide open in your in your home? You don't. Sure. Because you're defending your home, you're protecting it. But in this analogy, and we'd be, be going to other people's is. houses. So, to, I, I feel, sorry if I've interrupted sure. sorry. you. I feel that to leave your borders of your own country undefended is just utter stupidity. You're asking for people to walk in, take over, invade you, occupy your country and do what they like. Right, but as you say, this is not, um, what we're talking about is not uh, defence, this is going abroad. In your analogy of defending your home, yeah, protecting your home, this is going to other people's houses and uh, taking their things because you <coughs> need them for your but home. But they're defending those defender. places they're in. They're not, Britain, they're not causing war, they're defending against But you said Britain are simply defending, the British Armed Forces are simply defending our the borders. People. Is that all they're doing? I mean, no. they never went on expeditions and so, taken over their country. So nobody answered my original question. Sure. Would you be happy if we sacked all the defence forces and gave away all our rifles to put it bluntly, or Trident missiles. Would you be happy yeah, with that? In a very simplistic way. It's a very well, complex situation. Nobody's beginning. saying immediately throw away all your arms well, what would you and do? ignore the rest of the world. We're not saying that. But what there would, is an alternative to every time there's an in uh, dispute that you go into war. We're talking about bombing Libya now because of smugglers in boats. I mean, how stupid can you get? I mean, how many boats are in the Mediterranean where we need to bomb? Yeah. But I'm trying to get to the bottom. I, I came here, I've never been to a peace sure. meeting before, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to understand it. Well, and I'm asking, question, I, what? I do think we should get away, go yeah, do what? away with Trident. I think it serves no purpose whatsoever. Zero. You, Zero. None. Sorry, you've been Just a with huge everything. boondoggle, a scam. We're spending, if we renew Trident, we will be literally spending tens of billions of pounds for nothing. A little well, bit like those nothing. guys going over it's the trench. No, the, the thing is, we try, we try, as, soon as, you, as soon as you release a nuclear bomb, it sets off a reaction. The next person fires off their bomb, and before you know it, we're not having this discussion anymore. I think asking if, if you would get rid of all military capability, all defence, all this kind of thing, is an unfair characterisation. Um, it would be a bit like if I was saying, uh, well, do you think that we should just kill everyone else on the planet who isn't Britain? Because 
that would defend us. It's, it's no, an unfair I'm characterization. I'm asking what, what is your idea of, of peace? Does it mean getting rid of everything? And if you get rid of more modern weapons, does it mean you're keeping the weapons they had at the First World War? So if a conflict did start, if you were invaded or, or were forced to go to war to stop someone taking over your country, it would mean sending in billions of men like they did in the First World War. I think a general <laughs> consensus for the peace Instead movement of, is uh, no more weapons. wars abroad, uh, no more involvement in wars abroad, and uh, I think yeah, disbanding the, the nuclear weapons program simply because that is an aggressive So you believe project. in not getting involved in wars abroad, but keeping defence of your own country, is well, that what you mean? I think that depends, obviously. No, I'm trying you know. to understand it. Oh sure, but I mean the peace movement isn't me and Eric mm. or even or Susan, you know, it's this is a lot of people with a lot of different views just like you would have in any other political mm -hmm. movement. Um, but certainly I would say that the consensus is that uh, wars abroad are counterproductive and extremely damaging and essentially unjustifiable on sort of humanitarian grounds. Um, and that nuclear weapons are part of that because they are inherently about um, obliteration of uh, other people. You know, so there, there is no way to target a nuclear bomb, essentially, and that's part of what, what your position is. Last night uh, on the telly, there was talking about the in this uh, memorial place in Edinburgh, Scottish Memorial. Um, they'd counted up how many Scots were killed at the Dardanelles. Mm -hmm. 4,200. Mm. I've read, a, there's a book called Gallipoli Diaries, and it's a Turkish officer and an Australian officer, and each, you know, one's in one page facing each other, mm. and when it comes to near the end, the Turkish guy, he was saying that at the beginning they, were, they couldn't get straight to work to fight. They, they turned sideways, there were so many of them. Mm. Just before we took off, they were ten feet apart. He says if the sailors had went another, if the British, the Allies, mm. had actually done another push in a walk through. So it's really the generals. The make these mistakes. Well, absolutely. And I think this is the, the criticism of, of it is that mm -hmm. these military operations were uh, cynically motivated in the first place and the carelessness with which they were wasting people's lives, as you say. It's a terrible thing, more, and it's also a terrible thing if, you, if people don't defend the country because, I mean, look what happened to the countries in Europe when in the, first war, in the Second World War, sorry, when Hitler marched through them, all the millions that died in concentration camps and children as well being just mowed down and, and killed. So sure. but if you don't defend things when something like that happens, if you have no weapons, that's what would worry me. But if we can use the example of, say, yeah. Gallipoli that we just saw, um, I mean, from my own country, New Zealand is literally on the other side of the world. It, it's not, I mean, I don't think New Zealand barely even had any diplomatic relations with Turkey until uh, our soldiers showed up and were told to start attacking these people. Um, you know, there's no no way that that can be depicted as defence. And I think likewise with the British Empire as a whole, you know, Turkey uh, or the Ottoman Empire at the time was um, not a threat. The British Isles, as I say, was never at any risk of invasion because it had this maritime power. Um, so I think that there's a, certainly the way that we talk about it, even the fact that the government department is called the Ministry of Defence, not the Ministry of War, there's a way in which we are trained to think of all war as a matter of defence, as a matter of survival, when a lot of the time it really isn't. It's got other interests at heart, economic interests, or um, about preserving power. I think we should switch from what is to what could be. I mean, there's, this is not an ideal society, we know that. And what keeps me in a peace and justice movement is that, is, that it is revolutionary, in my mind, that unless we envision a different kind of society and are willing to just keep working away at it and, have, uh, and see that, that the way things are now don't need to stay that way. And we have to formulate the, 
you know, our vision and our methods and just kind of try to rework all that we've been brainwashed into, into thinking, you know, that has to just remain forever. It doesn't. And that's, you know, what was so moving in that film, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, you know, the waste and the stupidity of it and the, you know, it was just, um, you know, I think that we have to try, as I say, to, to imagine something different. The slogan, another world is possible. I mean, that's really what we have to have in mind. And, and, uh, has to I be think it was uh, the British generals, they were all from the Victorian Wars. They were still fighting it as if it was that. Yeah. And it wasn't until they, they wakened up after the Battle of the Somme when they lost so many men and they changed all the, the generals and they, they learnt more from that battle. That's, though they lost about 60,000, it was uh, a, a learning curve. Why don't just fight bad a better for the people that <laughs> died, but they, they started to learn and they changed all their, their methods. That's true, but I, I would and come back to it again. The last battle was Passchendaele, right? That's right. That was another complete slaughter. That was at the end of the war, and they were still engaging in, in similar kinds of tactics. Because, uh, actually, the, the British uh, high command, or the people in power, their conscious strategy was to wear down Germany. That was the idea, so, and it was not just uh, in terms of trench warfare. They were trying to starve them out. You know, there was the embargo, uh, the naval embargo, and they included food. And it was very intentional. That was the intent, is to starve them out, grind them down. And, you know, I guess in a way you could say it worked. Because after four years and who knows how many, 20 million people died, um, they won. <laughs> so, you know, from, the, from their point of view, they probably say, well, we did the right strategy. It was, it was worth it, right? We're here, they're not. Why don't you give your Kirchner quote? Oh, well, yeah. Uh, Kitchener was actually quoted at one point, at, uh, I think in Gallipoli. Uh, somebody said to them, you know, they're dying in droves in Gallipoli. The British Army is dying in droves and making no uh, gains. And he said, well, he didn't worry about the loss of soldiers. They could be replaced. It was the shells. That, that was what was worrying him. That was very much the mindset uh, of the British command. I don't think it really changed. I don't think that ever really changed, except one, one big change, they got the United States in the war. So then they could, it wasn't just British, Australian, New Zealand, French. It was American soldiers who were, uh, you know, could be thrown against the Germans and eventually they gave way. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, it does sort of puzzle me that you feel this sense of, of uh, besiege, because I don't quite get it. I mean, Britain seems to be pretty much isolated from much of the world. Uh, as Rory pointed out, the last invasion was in 1066. So, uh, why, why this sense that you need to, to be armed to the teeth to make sure that somebody undefined uh, is going to, uh, going to attack? I, just, I don't quite get where it's from. And I'll tell you what, really, let's really be honest. The British long ago, after World War II, ceased being a power. So all we, uh, all we in, in, in the UK are doing, we're, we're just tagging along the United States which, as you can tell, is where I'm from. So, uh, you know, I, got, I get this, uh, I grew up being bombarded with U.S. propaganda about how we're fighting for peace and democracy and all this stuff. But in any case, our, uh, the military here just does whatever they, they say in Washington. Literally, whatever Washington decides, that's what happens. So this analogy about, you know, defending your fort has really nothing at all to do with what's going on. What's going on is that the British government tails whatever the uh, American government tells them to do. That's the reality. That's what happens, you know? If uh, they tell them to go to, in Iraq, they go in Iraq. Afghanistan, they go in Afghanistan. Whatever D.C. decides, that's where it is. Because we're, you know, the best allies they have, right? Keep chasing after them. That's where the power is. Everybody knows it. That's where the power is in the United States. So, you know, let's be, let's be uh, frank. And, and, of course, the Tridents all come from the U.S., right? They're not actually British. Yeah, they're, from, they're, they're produced in the United States. They actually, the U.S. subsidizes them. Um, so that's what it's about. So we can decide that we want to continue to have our young men and women go fight American wars or not. I'd like to think we get to the point where we say, 
enough. Enough. <laughs> you know, the U.S. wants to be play superpower, global superpower. Let it do it with its own men and women, not with ours. Glad so everybody came, and I, I, I want to thank you because uh, I know it, I've been in your position. I've, <laughs> I've stood up in crowds that were very uh, uh, you know, antagonistic. It takes courage to do that, and I admire you doing that. So, even though I didn't agree with what you said. I admire your courage to come here and, and so say we it. hope you might feel that something too. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we both learn. Anyway, it's been good. i got to get the, uh, the CD. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you.